Nick's Southern Heritage Series. One, two, three, four, United States Marine Corps. One, two, three, four, United States Marine Corps. One, two, three, four, I love the Marine Corps. One, two, three, four, I love the Marine Corps. As much as America may be in love with their elite warriors, Pat Conroy actually had to live it. The son of an American Marine, he wrote about his life in South Carolina, living in Charleston, the king of the whole region. I just want to take a moment and say how much I love Charleston. It's an absolutely beautiful town and very emblematic of the Old South. Seafood and salty air, that's for me. If there's one town you ever stay in down here, make sure that's it. Of course, whenever I go there, I get to stay with this rich guy who takes me around to all the nice restaurants, so... Sucks to be you! Anyway, Donald Patrick Conroy was born in the ATL, son of Donald Conroy, a Marine colonel. He lived a classic military brat life, moving around from town to town and never having a steady childhood. In addition to that, his father was very abusive, forcing his children to be Marine hard in everything they did. When he was in the fifth grade, Conroy joined up with the school's basketball team and whipped the crap out of a bunch of sixth graders. Ever since, basketball was his sport. When he got older and wanted to go to college, his father happily signed him up for The Citadel, South Carolina's Marine College. I myself attended Georgia Military College of Augusta. So, kindred spirits, Hoss. After he graduated from college, he went on to get married and worked as an English teacher throughout South Carolina. It was during this period he produced his most famous books. He's written a myriad of works, but he's only really famous for three. His big hit, The Great Santini, published in 1976, recounts a fictionalized version of his childhood. In it, he renames his father Bull Meacham and uses his real-life nickname Santini for him. It details their arrival in Charleston and the beginning of stability of the family, but digs into the psychology of an abusive father. Really, the book's okay. The plot is a generic coming-of-age story where a son hates his father, but still feels for him, and in this case, he has legitimate reason to. In one scene, Santini loses a basketball game to his teenage son and proceeds to bounce the ball forcibly off his head until he's on the ground crying. When the mother intervenes to put a stop to it, he kicks her butt. Literally, he fires his foot into her buttocks and chases her into the kitchen. My question is, why did she leave in the first place? But for all of his abusiveness, I can't help but like the guy. Seriously, he's the only real good part of the novel. He is a Yankee and often speaks jeeringly of all Southerners. Well, he's from Chicago, I guess. I'll give him a pass. However, he calls us grits. He even had a recipe for the ideal grits. Boil them hard for 10 minutes, throw in some butter and sour cream, then toss them out in the road and get some real food. I get more of this sense that he just kind of hates everybody, kind of like Dirty Harry. Harry hates everybody. Limeys, mix, heaps, fat dagos, niggers, honkies, chinks, you name it. How does he feel about Mexicans? Ask him. Especially Spix. One of my favorite lines comes when the son is trying to intervene for a race riot between some idiot rednecks and some poor black people. More southern equality. Don't get between them grits and them niggers, boy. That about sums him up. Take him out of the equation and the book falls apart. I highly suspect this is because this was a bit of the book that was true, while the rest was concocted crap that pandered to genre conventions. But then, maybe he did grow up like that. I don't know. I don't want to spoil anything, but I can't help feel the ending is a little... Oedipic. You know? It's not reflective of what happened in real life, and it seems as though Conroy was venting a long, unexpressed desire. Oh well. When it was first published, Conroy's family got mad as hell at him for exposing their private life. They would attend promotional events like book signings and ask people not to buy the novel. Pat's wife even divorced him, partly, because of it. His father even approached him and insisted he wasn't like the character in the novel. Pat responded, You're right, Dad. You were worse. However, supposedly, of course, his father took a long, hard look at himself and quit being Santini. He healed his relationship with his son, and they looked at each other anew. He quit being a Marine and became a man. The book was turned into a film in 1979. It starred Robert Duvall in the leading role and a bunch of nobodies alongside him. I've never seen the film, as I've never taken the time. I can only say this. Robert Duvall is a very fine actor and has brought some great roles to the screen, but he's not Santini. Next would come The Lords of Discipline, a novel about Conroy's time in the Citadel. It details the coming of age of an older guy, about ready to graduate from college. He's in with his roommates, all of whom with interesting and distinct personalities that really draw them off the page and make the books interesting. My personal favorite is an Italian guy named Dante Pighetti, also known as Pig. 
And one scene, he gets in a fight and beats these losers up, and then everyone cheers his name. Pig! 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 And he responds, oink. Of course, it doesn't end too well for Pig. Anyway, this one has a little more of a plot. Following the first black student at the Citadel, with the main character having to help him through his rough first year. Again, this is the Marine College! And they don't cotton to no darkies around them parts. Like I said, get used to this racial stuff. It's the majority of what we're looking at. There are numerous subplots, though, each following the myriad of characters and all tying together very well. The hero also begins to hear rumors of The Ten, a sort of cabal within the college that, that weeds out people who are deemed unfit to wear the ring. One ring to rule them all. One ring to find them. One ring to bring them all. And in the darkness, bind them. No, not that ring, but instead the graduation ring of this institute. After he goes through his whole adventure, he meets the leader of The Ten and asserts that while he might not be mentioned in the history books, he sure as hell would write them. I can't help but feel this means there was some truth to all this. After the book was published, guess what happened? His roommates at the Citadel got mad at him for detailing their private lives. You know you've done something good when you piss off the most amount of people. He asserted the book wasn't just his experience at the Citadel, but rather a conglomeration of stories from all the different military colleges around the country. And he said he had the right to say whatever he wanted because he wore the ring. I read this when I was still at Georgia Military College of Augusta and laughed at how similar and different things were. There's a big thing about the code of honor, about duty, character, and country, which was completely ignored when I was there. Still, I like the novel and recommend it even above Santini. This book was made into a film, of course, which I've again never seen. It doesn't really look like it has much going for it either. I'll give it a skip. After incurring the wrath of his family and friends, he addressed the issue of hiding one's past directly in what is considered his best novel, Prince of Tides. Not Pimp of Tides, that's a little different. Prince of Tides concerns a man who is trying to save his sister. She's moved away from South Carolina and assimilated into the Yankee world of New York. She also suffers from severe mental illness and has a habit of slitting her wrists. Hey, it happens. Anyway, her brother Tom decides to sit down and talk with her psychiatrist, relating a lot of the stories of their childhood and giving an insight into the, her condition. This is the real meat of the book, the children's growth through the hero's telling. The stories range from sweet and heartwarming to dramatic coming-of-age stories and to even dark and horrifying nightmares that could only be solved by being confronted. My personal favorite one involves them kidnapping an albino dolphin from an aquarium and setting it free for no real reason. Meanwhile, Tom has to contend with the New York social life and come to grips with his own emotional traumas, eventually pulling his family together again in the end. So this is Conroy's masterpiece. It's really the culmination of the other two books, with many similar themes, such as an abusive military father and the idea of being ashamed of family secrets mixed with the spice and flavor of the South. It's almost like the Arabian Nights, being comprised of many small stories framed by a much bigger one. It's really dark in some places, and inspiring and hopeful in others. I kind of feel bad for Conroy. He could never write something this brilliant again. He could write things that are similar, but will ultimately be a retread of it. If you're only going to read one of Conroy's, this is it. One of the quintessential novels of the South. I guess if you're interested in the others, read this one last. They would only pale in comparison. The novel was turned into a movie starring Barbara Streisand as the psychiatrist Lowenstein. As much as I hate her as an actress, that has to be perfect casting. Conroy wrote more books that I didn't read, like Beach Music, kind of a retread of Prince of Tides, My Losing Season about Conroy's sports career, and South of Broad, a story about hoods in Charleston. I did read one of his later books, or at least I've skimmed through it, Recipes of My Life, a cookbook of all things. He details various recipes he's learned, along with stories from his life and why those p recipes matter to him. Cooking was a big part of his novels, too. I forgot that. It's a shame, really, since cooking is a good metaphor for writing. Sometimes a book is delicious, a thoroughly seasoned and well-put-out meal, while others are fried too long or left too raw. But when done right, it'll carry you into dreams. He kept it just to blow that young Marine's ass away. He kept it just to blow that young Marine's ass away.